This is Port Stories, brought to you by the Ports Past and Present Project. Sharing stories from five ports in Ireland and Wales. Dublin, Rosslare, Hollyhead, Fishguard and Pembroke Dock. Project funded by the European Regional Development Fund through the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. Welcome to the Port Stories podcast by Ports Past and Present, which is a European development project funded by the Ireland-Wales Cooperation Programme. I'm Claire Nolan and I'm a researcher on the project. And today I'm talking to Professor Vicky Cummings, who is Professor of Neolithic Archaeology at the University of Central Lancashire. Vicky specialises in the Mesolithic and Neolithic Archaeology of Britain and Ireland, with a particular expertise in the prehistory of the Irish Sea Zone. So welcome, Vicky. Thank you for coming today. And uh, really, I just wanted to ask you um, to begin with, uh, could you tell me a bit about your work on the archaeology of the Irish Sea Zone and, and why you became interested in it? Yeah, sure. Um, I started um, doing some research on on, ne- on the Neolithic, in particular on monuments. Um, about 20 years ago, I did my doctoral research, particularly focusing on, on Wales. And I was particularly interested in, in the early Neolithic of, of West Wales. And it became fairly obvious that um, you can't really look at an area like Wales in isolation. It's part of a a broader area. And one of the things that was really obvious straight away, and and lots of people have said this previously, um, is that the monuments that you find uh, in Wales are very similar to ones on the other side of the Irish Sea. Um, In this instance, um, these monuments are found in in West Wales, but they're also found throughout most parts of Ireland, not all all of Ireland, but most parts of Ireland. So as my research um, developed, um, I became particularly interested in actually looking at the Irish Sea Zone as an area of study. And this is something, it does have quite a long uh, history of research. Um, Earlier scholars of the Neolithic had had looked at this area, Um, but it sort of of, um, slipped out of focus a little bit for for a few decades. And I think that's partly because people were starting to focus much more on regional sequences. And that often tied up very much with um, the nation that they were in. So there was a very strong drive to look at Scottish, the Scottish Neolithic, the Welsh Neolithic, um, and of course the, the Irish Neolithic as well. So I was quite interested in, in starting to sort of make and have a look again at that broader Irish Sea area. So I've done a number of projects over the years, starting with the with the monuments. I keep coming back to the monuments, but um, we did a conference back in 2004 on the Neolithic of the Irish Sea Zone with colleagues um, from both sides of the Irish Sea contributing and talking about different areas. Um, I then did a, a, a bigger piece of work, which was looking at monuments either side um, of the Irish Sea. So basically everything around the Irish Sea. So that was now West Wales, that was uh, Western Scotland, and then all the way down the eastern seaboard of Ireland and uh, comparing and contrasting monuments and material culture from the early Neolithic either side of the the Irish Sea. So that was uh, that was a really great project. And from that, I then developed another project, which was looking um, at specifically at interactions. And I actually ran a project up in Kintyre in Western Scotland uh, for five years with another colleague, um, Gary Robinson at Bangor University. Um, and we were actually investigating the, the, the direct connections between Scotland and Ireland. And Kintyre is actually the closest, closest point um, between the, the British mainland and the Irish, uh, Irish mainland. And uh, it, it's you could see it where we were working. We, Ireland would, if it was sunny, Ireland would be there. It would look very, very close. If you couldn't see Ireland, it was probably about to start raining. Um, and we did a project that looked at um, the southern, the southern part of, of uh, Kintyre, and we found lots and lots of connections with Ireland. So that was a, a very specific project, um, and I can talk talk more about what we found there if if that's of interest. Um, it it. And then since then, really, I've just continued to, to, to focus on particularly monuments either side of the of the Irish Sea. So it really is a, a long term interest because I just I just don't think you can look at one landmass without understanding what's going on the on the other landmass. So the long and the short of it is I think there's been very strong connections across the Irish Sea for, for, for thousands of years. And it's just something that I think is is, is really interesting and worth exploring. 
Yeah, no, definitely. And it sounds, you know, that really crosses over with the work of um, the Ports Project. And I guess we're trying to look at how, oh, through time over history, that how the, the two areas have related to each other. Um, and one of the questions I was going to ask you in, in relation to that is, you know, some prehistorians have suggested that that the, the the Irish Sea was a barrier in the past, and then others have suggested that it might have been like a, a cultural province. Mm. Um, how what are, how do your findings relate to that? Yeah, it's it it sort of comes in in waves, and no pun intended there. Um, I think for for a long time, certainly early on, um, there was a sense that the Irish Sea in particular was a, an area of cultural connection or you use the phrase a, a province so that it was the areas around the Irish Sea were were clearly they shared some similarities in material culture they they shared architectural similarities in things like monuments and I think early scholars were quite happy and quite confident that people would have been moving around that area over the last couple of uh, decades, though, there's been a bit of a, a sort of a change uh, in focus. Um, and there's been a narrative, certainly for the start of the Neolithic, so the start of farming, the very first appearance of, of agriculture, the first pottery, um, that actually maybe this was something that was perhaps um, in, uh, introduced into Britain and Ireland through the indigenous Mesolithic population. And so there was a sort of a, a swing away there, perhaps from this idea of a lot of people moving around. I think there was a sense where maybe the indigenous people brought brought the Neolithic over from the mainland. They were maybe in occasional contact. There was a suggestion of not a great deal of movement. Um, there's been a, a big change, a, a sea change really in the last few years um, with ancient DNA. So uh, with the advent of, of ancient DNA um, and being able to explore the actual genetic origins of people, we've seen that the start of the Neolithic in bro both Ireland and Britain clearly involved the movement of a lot of people. Um, quite how that worked, we're, we're still figuring out figuring that out but the prime movers in the in the arrival and spread of the neolithic don't seem to have been the indigenous mesolithic people it seems to have been incomers from mainland europe probably from from france or the low countries um, and clearly they would have had to come to britain and ireland using boats so we've got people who were farming they were had been farming for for many hundreds of years if, if not longer they were established farmers and yet they were also very able mariners and this has sort of changed the the narrative again to actually maybe neolithic people agricultural people were actually really good mariners they were sailing around a lot so there's this idea of of people actually sailing now all over the place so quite clearly we know the neolithic arrives in Britain, it arrives into Ireland. But I think there's now a sense that people were moving around in, it's been described as a sea of small boats, you know, lots of boats moving around lots, a, a lot of the time. And that's again, sort of changed the narrative a little bit. So I think we're, we're now much more comfortable with the idea of people moving around and the sea not being a barrier, but actually being an enabler. So in the early Neolithic, again, that the narrative has changed. At one point we were thinking that, a lot of um, Britain and Ireland would have been cleared of woodland, and certainly there is some of that going on. Um, but I think we we now realise it's perhaps not quite to the extent that we originally envisaged. So actually, you've got a lot of a lot of, um, of both land masses essentially covered with pretty dense tree cover in the early Neolithic, and that means it would have been really hard for people to move around through what perhaps we would now think of the easiest um, routes through particular landscapes. And actually it might have been boat travel, whether that's on rivers or across the sea, might have actually been um, in many ways much easier for people. So I think we're, we're pretty confident now that people were moving around. They were moving around a lot. They were using boats. The boats don't survive very well in the archeological record, but we know that they had the, the ability to do that because well, they Neolithic people arrived they, in Britain and Ireland. They went to Orkney, they went to Shetland. These are hard, difficult sea crossings. Um, so we know that they had the technology to do that. So, yeah, I think actually now um, the Irish Sea is, is definitely considered to be very active uh, in the Neolithic. And, and, and I think we knew that anyway from the material culture and the monuments that were that were around. It's quite 
is getting to grips with the level of contact i think that's that's been difficult but i think we're quite comfortable now with people moving around a lot in the neolithic wow that's fascinating yeah and um and well so our you know the project focuses on sort of dublin rosslare hollyhead fish garden pembroke dock so um the, the Welsh and Irish coastlines. And can you, in relation to that activity that was going on, can you identify through maybe sites and monuments or artifacts, um, connections that were occurring maybe but, but, I, through trade or family or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of, of things that are really clear and the rest I think is, is, is at the moment speculative, but we, again, we might be able to say more about that as we, as we, as we move through and develop new techs and techniques like the, the DNA. And first I think is the monuments. The, the, we've always known that monuments either side of the Irish Sea are very similar. Um, my particular uh, focus over the last few years has been on dolmens. Um, so this is again, this is one of the challenges of studying this kind of material, but then that dolmens, what I call dolmens are known as um, different names either side of the Irish Sea, which makes it quite tricky for, for uh, people to sort of always see the see the uh, similarities um, across that broader area. So in West Wales, they would be called portal dolmens, whereas in Ireland, they're called portal tombs. There's some down in the very um, southwest tip of England as well, where they're known as cromlechs. Um, so they've got a whole variety of, of different names, um, but they are broadly the same thing either side of the Irish Sea. They're early Neolithic, in fact, they're some of the earliest Neolithic um, monuments um, on both sides of the Irish Sea. Portal tombs are found found in most parts of Ireland. Um, they're only found, however, on that sort of western side of Britain. There's a very, very small number down in, in, in Medway um, in southeast England, and then a, a splat, sort of a, a light smattering of them across um, the Cotswold. But for the most part, they're in they're in Western Britain, and they're incredibly similar either side of the Irish Sea. I, I think um, you know people must have, have have had some sense of what was going on either side, even if they weren't directly involved in building them either side. I think there's there's some form of knowledge of what's going on um, across that broader area. As you then go into the developed Neolithic, um, you've then got passage passage tombs or passage graves either side of the Irish Sea. And again, that North uh, North Wales, um, uh, central, um, yeah, cent central side of Eastern Ireland, again, you've got a very strong connection there. So the Bruna Boyne uh, World Heritage Site, um, but there's similar monuments on, on Anglesey, two, two sites on Anglesey. So again, some very clear sort of similarities in, in monuments. It's the same with material culture. Um, there's the movement of axes um, across the Irish Sea. Um, so the, the biggest group of axes um, or axe source in, in, in Britain is Langdale, just up the road from me here. Um, and those are found throughout Britain and Ireland. And again, you've got um, an axe source uh, in Northeastern Ireland, Tifa Bully and Rathlin Island. And again, axes are moving across the Irish Sea. Back to Kintyre, where I was working, there's a horde of, um, of, of Irish uh, flint axes and flakes um, in Kintyre as well. So clearly things are actually moving across the Irish Sea, presumably with people. Um, perhaps they're taking them as, as gifts. And this is where I think perhaps when we begin to, to think about where research might take us in the future, are things like um, the ancient DNA. So at the moment, we're at very early stages of just identifying these broad scale migrations um, from Europe into Britain and Ireland. But actually, we're also starting to be able to see much more detailed, um, specific family relationships. Um, so I was very lucky to be involved uh, in a project recently where we looked at the site of Hasleton North in Gloucestershire, and we did the ancient DNA sampling of a number of individuals there. And we found that the vast majority were related to each other. And there, so there was a, a single male. He had, uh, whether simultaneously or at different times, four, uh, four female partners with which he pre uh, reproduced and produced offspring. His, his sons were then buried and his, uh, the 
family of his sons were also buried in the monument. So this is clearly a, a monument. It's being built for a particular family group, a particular kinship network. And as we now move th- move uh, on with ancient DNA, it may well be that we can actually pick up family relationships beyond a single site. And so it might be that we start to be able to pick up individuals who are related either side of the Irish Sea. That would be really exciting. There's, there's some preliminary um, results already showing connections across Ireland. Um, so West and East Ireland, that's, that, was, that was published by um, colleagues a few years ago. And again, the more DNA samples we pick up, we might be able to start to see family, actual genuine people um, moving. Um, and another thing that we, we, uh, we, do rec- we have been doing more recently is um, isotope analysis. And isotope analysis can tell you from which area potentially people have been living in their lifetime. And back to the case study from from Gloucestershire, there we saw that although people were being buried in this particular monument, they were actually ranging over 40 kilometres in their lifetime. So now you put that in a Western Welsh or an Eastern Irish context, actually we could well see people moving across the Irish Sea within their lifetimes. And it's possible that, again, as these, uh, these techniques develop, we might be able to start to pick that up um, either side of the Irish Sea. The only caveat to that is that you've got very bad bone preservation, particularly in West Wales and, and often in Ireland. So uh, it is uh, predicated on uh, the survival of bone, which is always one of the limiting factors of studying the, the Neolithic in this particular area. But I think watch this space. There should be exciting developments in the next five to 10 years. So, yeah, I mean, if because um, it, it sounds like... If, from what I've come across in the past, that maybe there was different things happening between sort of North Northern Ireland and and Scotland, and then down between the southeast coast of Ireland and Wales. Mm. Um, and in that tradition of portal tomb building, um, I'm just wondering: are there are there particular examples on either side that are so similar, like that are you know that you think, gosh, they must have been the same people? It's it's a really good uh, it's a really good question, and the answer is no two portal tombs are the same, and that's no two portal tombs are the same within Ireland, in an area of Ireland, in Wales. They're all a little bit different. Um, there are literally no two sites that are the same. But I think if you if you, if you visit them, and and I've visited, I think it's fair to say most of them <laughs> in Ireland and Wales, um, there are broader themes that come out. And what you can see across that broad area is them using the same idea again and again and again. And a lot of it is about getting a really, really big stone and lifting that up and displaying that big stone. And that seems to be the thing that's shared either side of, of, the, of the Irish Sea. The, the biggest portal, uh, portal tomb is, is in Ireland, um, about 150, 160 tonne capstone. Um, but in West Wales, uh, there's another particularly large site where it's about 80 tons. So it's the get it's the it's the same general idea um, that they're using. Looking beyond um, portal tombs, the only type of monument I've not talked about are probably a little bit later, certainly in Ireland, and that's the court tombs. And that that is a that is quite an interesting um, relationship. This is more now. Um, paralleled in Western Scotland. So in Western Scotland, you've got Clyde tombs as, as they're known. And then in the northern half of the island of Ireland, you have these, these court tombs. And colleagues have dated these to about 3650 in Ireland. And they're probably a little bit earlier in Western Scotland. And again, if you look back at early, early literature, people like Stuart Piggott we talk where they actually referred to it as a single cultural group, the Clyde Carlingford culture it was known as. Um, and there are again in, in this series of monuments clear differences either side of the Irish Sea, but I think again they're drawing on broader, broader sets of ideas um, when they're building their monuments. And they they are very, very similar. They're a little bit different, but very, very similar. In actual fact, the, the biggest difference in, in many, many ways is actually 
the east and the west of Ireland. So if you if you uh, visit any of the really fantastic enclosed cork cairns over in the west of Ireland, they really are very, very different from the, I think, the more sort of simple um, single cork cairns in, in the east of Ireland, and they're paralleled with the ones in Western Scotland. So I think what I think what we're getting at there is probably ebbs and flows of contact at certain points in time. I mean, I'm talking about the early Neolithic, so from about 3,800 up to, I suppose, about 3,400, so 400 years. But um, I don't think we should see um, the contact just being identical across that 400 years. At some points, it might have been really regular between, say, Eastern Ireland and Western Scotland, whereas at other points it was perhaps more... Uh, relevant or the focus was on other areas across the Irish Sea. So actually it's quite a complex, almost mosaic of different things going on and, and it's it's teasing out the different times in which different connections were relevant, I think, which is what we're now now trying to do. No, it's so interesting because we, you know, with our project it's it's sort of similar actually the as it goes through into more recent periods, so into history itself and mm. uh, the early modern period that things change sometimes there's great connection sometimes there's conflict going on mm. and, you know it, it's uh so i guess it's just the nature of people and politics and <laughs> that's uh, it yeah you know, yeah um but um it will be interesting to see more research come out in this area i think going forward um so i get on to more kind of even more fun stuff <laughs> i'm just wondering what your favorite sites are on on in these areas kind of um in wales and ireland yes i've, I've got quite a few um and for, for lots of different reasons i think um my my favorites in in wales i mean pentra van is just a fantastic site um there's just something about it. It's it's very nicely kept. Um, so it's an, in guardianship. Um, and it's just an incredible site. And every time I go there, I just think, wow, this is this is just a, it's a, a portal dolmen worth worth visiting. It's it's very photogenic. It's it's a beautiful spot in, in Pembrokeshire. So that um, that is a, a, a real favourite, I should say. Um, a lesser known site would be uh, Lech Edrebeth in Pembrokeshire. Um, and I, I can't really put my finger on why it's such a nice site. Um, it's much less well known. It's it's not visited that often, but it just it just really is a, a very visually uh, attractive monument. It sort of everything about a dolmen, which is just lifting up a big stone and displaying it to its its best with the fantastic Priscelli Mountains in the background. So it's it's a fan, fantastic site to visit. And actually, there's lots in Pembrokeshire. Carrick Coyton in the in the little village of Newport again is a, a lovely site, and that's been excavated as well. So you can sort of you, you know more about that site when you're visiting it. Um, over in Ireland, um, there are some fantastic sites in in Dublin, but uh, or around Dublin, they're not so accessible. Um, so I suppose I'd have to head down to County Carlow and Browns Hill. That's the site with the biggest uh, dolmen capstone. It's about 160 tonnes. And it's, a, it's an absolute monster. Um, it's a great site to visit. Um, it's, it's, not the most, it's not the most impressive, I have to say. It, it, I mean, it's a giant stone, but they, they didn't manage to get the back up, the, the, the rear end of the dolmen up. So it's like, you know, the biggest isn't always the best in this instance, um, so, but it is it is well worth visiting. If you want to see the kind of crazy stuff that Neolithic people were trying to lift, the crazy level of, of stone, of, um, just imagine lifting that front of that monument up. It would be um, absolutely fantastic. Again, a, a lesser known site uh, would be Harris Town. I think that's County Kilkenny. Um, again, not visited very often but it's an absolutely bonkers, bonkers site. It's huge. It's, it's the, it's the capstone isn't anywhere near the size of um, Brown's Hill. And yet they've put it on such a crazy angle. Um, it is just the most uh, incredible site. Um, I went there, was there a few weeks ago and you, you just can't sort of can't believe that people um, built this, you know, uh, 6,000 years ago. Well worth a visit because, again, they've just um, we were joking when we were there that they they built the little there's a little um, chamber at the back, which we were joking that they they built in um, 
in uh, in imperial and then they changed the measurements halfway through to to metric and so they got all their measurements wrong and that you end up with this sort of giant portal and this giant sort of entrance way it is an absolutely fantastic uh, fantastic site and well worth visiting but so much great stuff uh, in both wales and ireland to visit those are just a few examples lots and lots of fantastic dolmens to visit mm -hmm. and as, as you were saying that you um did a journey using some of the ports that we're engaged with. So you went from Hollyhead to Dublin and then back via Ross Lair. That's right, and, yeah. And Pembrokeshire. And I, I wonder, did, did you kind of, because you were going to see sites along the way, do, do you kind of start thinking about sea crossings and in, in, you know, in prehistory while you're on those modern crossings? Yeah, I mean, the modern crossings are obviously very comfortable and they're quite, quite quick. And um, I think one of the things about the early Neolithic is um, people died, didn't seem to be risk averse. In fact, they seem to sort of almost welcome um, going, going um, to sort of risky places and doing risky things. Um, so a sort of a classic example of that, I mentioned earlier, Langdale Axes. Um, if you've ever been up the Langdale Pikes in, in the Lake District, where they were quarrying the stone from, it's really exposed. It's really steep. You know, it's pretty, pretty dangerous. And yet they kept going back there time and time again. It's the same if you've been to Teva Bullia. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty uh, steep mountain um, to, to be going up. Um, and I think probably people would have... Um, perhaps gain things like prestige, perhaps from from going to these remote or extreme places, and you may well have gained quite a lot of um, prestige or status from being a mariner and being able to to cross the Irish Sea successfully. I mean, you'd need to know what you were doing. Um, you know, you wouldn't have the. You know, we go over on these big boats with big engines. Um, obviously, they don't have any of that, so they they would need to to, to understand the tides. They would need to be very able mariners. Again, when we were working up at Kintyre, um, it made us realise um, actually how easy and also how difficult the crossing was. So Kintyre to Ireland is, is 12 miles. Um, people from Campbelltown uh, reported often going to um, Antrim for their uh, Sunday lunch in a boat. Um, so it was quite common. Um, but you had to know what you were doing. So you would go around the southeastern tip of Kintyre and off across the Irish Sea. You didn't go to the Mull of Kintyre, where it was extremely dangerous, steep cliffs, lots of eddies. So again, it's the sort of knowledge of, of the crossing and being capable of doing that, I think probably was, um, you know, potentially prestigious. But again, we think, oh my God, imagine crossing the Irish Sea on a little skin, in a little skin boat. You know, it sounds absolutely dreadful, but you know, they just didn't have the risk assessment forms that we do nowadays. I think they were off we go and it's going to be exciting and, you know, and uh, taking it that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Different worlds. Completely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. um, so that's amazing. Thank you so much. And I'm just uh, the only thing I was going to ask was, like, why would you recommend that people go visit some of these sites? I think if you'd like to know uh, what it was like in the in the past, um, just go along and have a look at these sites and try and sort of strip away all of our modern understanding of, of the world. You know, they had no idea that we lived on a planet. They had no idea what the sun was. You know, there was no metalwork in the Neolithic. All they had was woodworking. They had stone. You know, these were these the to all intents and purposes, exactly the same as us. And yet they chose to spend their spare time lifting up gigantic stones and displaying them. And just, just thinking about um, how hard that would be um, and why people were doing it, I think is a really exciting challenge. And they're just, they are in some of the most beautiful parts of Wales and Ireland. Um, and it does get you out there looking at them, thinking about what it might have been like for the in the past, but also experiencing, you know, the fantastic landscapes of, of Wales and Ireland nowadays. So go and visit them. They're well, well worth seeing. <laughs> fantastic oh thank you so much vicky i really really appreciate you talking to us today um so i think we'll we'll come to a close now but, but um thanks again and uh, i hope we will encounter you on the project at some point in the future again nice chatting to you, thank you.